Well, welcome back to our class and to those of you watching by DVD. I'm glad that all of you have taken time to come and learn a little bit more about spiritual gifts. In our last session, we learned about evangelism and the gift of evangelism are those who bring good news of great joy to all people, much like the angels did when they announced Christ's birth. They have the ability to go out, sense when people are ready to accept Christ, and present the gospel in a way that is meaningful to that individual, relevant to their lives, and draws them like a magnet to Jesus Christ. They are able to initiate spiritual conversations everywhere they go. All of us are to be evangelists, but not all of us have the gift of evangelism, and we're grateful to God for those people who do. In session 37, we're going to begin talking about an entire chapter of the Bible, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and the motivation for using spiritual gifts. So we will not be jumping from one passage to another. Instead, uh, we will talk about 1 Corinthians 13 in a more expository way. It's a beautiful day outside. It's a Saturday and we're dressed in our finest clothes and we go to church and we open the door and we are greeted and we are asked, are you friends of the bride or friends of the groom? If you're friends of the bride, you sit on the left-hand side. If you're friends of the groom, you sit on the right-hand side. That's in my culture. Yours may be different. But this is not different. At some point, the pastor, the minister, stands up and begins with words very similar to these. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here in the sight of God to join this man and this woman in the bonds of holy matrimony. Marriage is a sacred institution instituted by God himself, saying, For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united with his wife, and they will become one flesh. Love is the foundation of every good marriage. And Paul has given us the best definition of love in 1 Corinthians 13. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. Almost every wedding that I go to, 1 Corinthians 13, is used as a basis of the marriage. That marriage is a commitment of love from one person to the other, with specific vows given to be together forevermore committed to one another with the foundation and the glue being love. However, 1 Corinthians 13 was not written with the idea of marriage behind it. In fact, it was written in context of spiritual gifts. And while it is probably the best definition ever given by any person of love, and certainly one of the most beloved passages in Scripture. It's really not about marriage at all. It's about the motivation for us using our spiritual gifts. On either side of chapter 13 in 1 Corinthians are passages about spiritual gifts. We've spent a great deal of time talking about 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and all the gifts that are listed there. Chapter 13 talks about love, and chapter 14, which we'll study in the next two sessions, talks about warnings concerning two gifts, the gifts of prophecy and the gift of tongues. Now, why would Paul begin talking about spiritual gifts in 12, and then in 14 talk about tongues and prophecy, and in the middle, just kind of drop in this thing about love, like, oh man, I should talk with everybody about love. No, it's part of a flow of his thinking. He's thinking, you're using your spiritual gifts. The only reason you use those spiritual gifts 
is because you love other people. And then he moves on to, and now for some warnings about some spiritual gifts. So I've probably spoiled 1 Corinthians 13 for all of you that when you go to a wedding the next time, you'll think, oh, this has nothing to do with marriage. It's about spiritual gifts. But I assure you that it's appropriate for pastors and for couples to use this in a, in a marriage ceremony because it is about love. And it's about love in this context applied to spiritual gifts. But love is something applied in every context of our life. But in this session and in this chapter, it applies to spiritual gifts. And Paul is giving us the motivation, the reason why, the purpose behind our using our gift to serving other people. Now, I'm older than many of you watching this, either here in the classroom or those by DVD, but you may have heard a song that's back from the 1960s when I was growing up by a mu musician named Tina Turner. And she sang a song, What's love got to do with it, got to do with it? I see a lot of blank stares. What's love got to do with it? Well, I'll tell you, in the context of spiritual gifts, what's love got to do with it? Everything. Everything. If you do not serve out of love for other people, don't serve. Love must be the motivation behind your serving others by taking your gift and having the Holy Spirit work through you to empower you to touch other lives. Love is the basis of the Christian life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. See, God was serving us by giving us his Son. There was no other way we could be saved. And why did he do it? Because God so loved the world. And this is the reason that we serve, or it's the reason we should serve. Let's take a look at how love has to do with spiritual gifts and why I know this passage isn't really about marriage in this context. As we begin in 1 Corinthians 13, chapter, uh, verse 1, Paul begins and says, And now I will show you the most excellent way. He has just be finished talking about spiritual gifts, talking about us being united in the body, talking about a categorization of gifts and their role in the church. And then he says, and now, let me show you a more excellent way. There's something even greater than spiritual gifts. Love. He says, if I speak in the tongues and of men and of angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. This might also be interpreted, if I speak using the gifts of tongues, then if I don't have love, it's a resounding gong or clanging cymbal. What does he mean? If I'm not using my gift of tongues out of love, you might as well be listening to a gong clanging back and forth. You might as well be listening to cymbals. It won't make any sense to you. It won't accomplish the purpose that God intended. Love must be at the basis. But notice as he begins with a spiritual gift. That's the context. And then in verse 2 he says, If I have the gift of prophecy and I can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but have not love, I am nothing. Here he talks about three gifts. He says, if I have prophecy, and it gives me the ability to understand hidden things, mysteries, and if I have the gift of knowledge, and if I have the gift of faith, even faith that could move a mountain. But if I don't have love, I am nothing. Love must be the basis, the foundation 
for using those three gifts. And then he goes on in verse 3 and says, If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. Here he uses the gift of giving. If I use the gift of giving and give all I possess to the poor, and then he talks about surrendering my body to the flames. This is often considered a spiritual gift of martyrdom, of giving your life once and for all and finally for the sake of the kingdom. In a future session, we're going to talk about other possible gifts that people believe should be included in spiritual gifts, but I have not included, and this is one of them the gift of martyrdom, giving your life for the sake of the gospel. You may not know this, but every one of the 12 apostles died a martyr's death except one, the apostle John. He died on the island of Patmos after writing the uh, book of Revelation. All 11 others of them, they died as martyrs for the sake of the kingdom, either by the sword or by crucifixion. Peter himself, when he was crucified in Rome, he asked that they crucify him upside down because he did not want to be crucified in the same manner as Jesus and consider himself to be in the same category as Christ. All of them died. So martyrdom is certainly something that the early church experienced. It's something that people in China are experiencing and in many other parts of the world. So that's another gift we'll look at. The other thing I want you to notice is not only does he use the gifts and say you must have love when you use these gifts or it accomplishes nothing. He says it three different ways. In verse 1, he's talking about, but if I have the gift of tongues and I don't have love, then you're not going to understand it. Here he's talking about there won't be a result. There won't be the effect. And then he says, if I have prophecy, and if I have knowledge, and if I have mountains, but love isn't underneath it, I am nothing. Not only did I accomplish nothing, but I myself in my character am nothing. So what I do, what I am, and in the last part, he says, if I have the gift of giving or the gift of martyrdom, but it's not based on love, then I don't get anything. I mean, he's pretty much covered life. If what I do isn't based on love, if who I am isn't based on love, and if I do and am something that isn't based on love, then there will be no benefit to me. He's saying love is everything. TBS Seminary is a nonprofit project. Our joint effort will bring about the common purpose of making Christian education available around the world and developing good Christian servant leaders. You have a unique opportunity to partner in this effort through your prayer and or financial support of TBS Ministry. For more information, please visit tbsseminary.com. So having tied in spiritual gifts from chapter 12, to chapter 13, and after emphasizing that love is the basis of all service, then he goes on to the most eloquent, most descriptive, best love description of love that has ever been written, this written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Let's move to the chalkboard where I've listed these different things in two categories because Paul talks about eight qualities eight descriptors of love, and eight of them here are positive, and eight of them here are negative. So there are 16 descriptors he gives, and what he says is, this is what love is, this is what love is not. This is what you should do when you serve out of love. This is what you should not do when you serve because it is not love. So let's read through this and see how he jumps back and forth between these categories. He says that love is patient. 
He says, love is kind. He says, it doesn't envy, it doesn't boast. He says, it is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered, not keep record of wrongs. And then he continues on, it doesn't delight in evil, but it rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always preferes. Love never fails. So he begins with two positive qualities. Always a good thing to begin with the positive. Imagine how depressing this would be if he just began with, love does not envy, love is not proud. You begin with the negative and right away you have a negative attitude. Instead, he does something that is a very good principle when you must share something with someone that is not something they want to hear. Begin with the positive, then tell them the negative, then end with the positive. When you begin with the positive, you have a more receptive audience. You share the bad news in the middle, but then you end with the positive so you end on a good note. You'll find that if you have difficult things to say to your friends, to your family, and you use that approach, you'll have a much more receptive audience and they'll much, be much more willing to hear what you have to say. And I believe that's the reason Paul began with two positives, moved to all the negatives, and then ended with a bunch of positives. He begins with patient and kind, lists all of these, and then comes back to all of these. Now, what is he saying in these verses? In the verse, he's saying these are qualities of love that should be evident in the love you express. When you serve other people, they should be able to see these qualities in you as you serve. And if they see these other qualities in you, then you might not as well have served at all because it hasn't benefited them, it hasn't benefited you, and it hasn't brought glory to God. So he says, all right now, when you serve, first of all, be patient in your service. Remember that other people may not be as mature as you are in your faith. Be patient with them. Take your time and understand where they're at. And be kind. You're giving something you have to someone else. When you do that, you do that out of kindness. And then as he goes down, continuing the positives in verse 7, I love the next few things. He says, it rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perse perseveres, and never, ever, ever fails. So he's saying that as you serve out of love and you see people responding, rejoice because the truth has been heard and lives have been transformed. And then he goes on and he says, and when you are a representative of Jesus and you're serving another person with your spiritual gift, then you're doing it to protect them so that they do not wander from the path. You are building a trust relationship with them. You are emboldening them to hope for the future, to continue on despite uh, whatever circumstances they face, and that love itself will never fail. Love will always succeed. So if you serve out of love, you will always succeed. And then he lists eight things that are all too human and all too often do appear in our service. And when they do, we just need to confess and to move on. And one more time, ask God to forgive us and continue to serve. But we should not envy what other people have. Remember that Barnabas did not envy that Paul had a greater gift of leadership than he did. Instead, he was humble enough to acknowledge that Paul's leadership gift was stronger. So he didn't envy it. Neither did Paul boast about it. And he wasn't proud about it. So don't be rude when you're working with people. 
that will certainly push them further away in their spiritual development. Don't be doing your service because you want to get something out of it. You want people to think highly of you or you just want to feel good yourself. It says don't get angry, tying it in with patience. And this is one that happens all too often in love, both in service but especially in marriage. There's a tendency to, in the back of our minds, keep a record of how many times and ways the other person has hurt us. And then when you get into a fight or a disagreement, you bring all those things out. Like uh, in my culture, we call it bringing the kitchen sink out, meaning everything comes out. Paul says, that's not love. You know, don't keep a list. This person did this thing right, this thing wrong. Instead of rejoice with the truth. Don't delight in evil. Well, he gives a wonderful definition of spiritual gifts there. And then at the very last section, verses 8 through 13, he talks about the future of spiritual gifts. And we've mentioned before, this is the passage that there's some disagreement on. And I'm going to explain what my view is as we go along and compare it with some of the others. After says, uh, Paul says, love never fails, he goes on to, but where there are prophecies, which he talked about earlier, they will cease. Where there are tongues, which was mentioned before, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. He's mentioned three of the gifts that he began this chapter with. And he said, all of those are going to end someday. Now the question that is the basis of the conflict on this passage is, when will they actually end? Did they end when the apostles died at the first generation of the church's end? Did it end when the Bible became available to people so that they would know the truth? And my belief is that's not what this passage is saying. Instead, as we go on, it says, for we know in part and we prophesy in part. He's saying that we don't know everything there is to know. God knows it. We can only prophesy the part that God's revealed to us. And here's the part that I think makes it clear. But when perfection comes, the imperfect disappears. The question is, what does Paul mean about perfection? Those who would believe that spiritual gifts have ended would mean the Bible came. It's perfect. It's without error. So when it, it came, these other gifts were not needed. Prophecy and tongues and knowledge, they were no longer needed. I believe it means when perfection comes is when Christ comes again. And that He is the one who is perfect. He is perfection. And that is the basis of the debate. What does it mean? But to me, it seems ludicrous, crazy to say all these gifts ended just because the Bible came. Especially when we see all these gifts being used in the church today. How much better to say all the gifts are given to us by God. And you do not give a gift and take it back. You give a gift and it becomes that person. I don't think that God would give us a gift and then take it away from us. Instead, he's, going, he's given us the gift and then those gifts will leave when he gives us another gift, Jesus Christ at the second coming. So perfection, I believe, is Christ. The imperfect is our life right now. In fact, the imperfect is the use of our gifts right now because they will be imperfectly used. And then he uses two illustrations to make things clear. Good teachers do this all the time. They try to provide an illustration from life so people can understand it. That's what Paul is saying. He's just said, when Jesus comes, spiritual gifts will disappear. Now, example number one. When I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. In this, he's comparing our lives now here on earth as being children. 
that we talk like children, we think like children, we reason like children, and when Jesus comes, we'll be mature, fully mature, and we will be fully like Christ. So the childish things will be behind us. Then he goes to the second example, which is a mirror. And he says, now, in this life on earth, we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. The now is here on earth. It's like we're looking at a mirror and we're not seeing a perfect reflection of who we are. But later, we will be face to face with Jesus and we will see ourselves as Jesus sees us. So the imperfect view we have of ourselves will be replaced with the perfect view that Christ has. To me, that makes much more sense of how this flows than to say, well, yeah, it's talking about these spiritual gifts passed away. Um, I think it has to do with Christ's second return. The gifts are no longer needed. We will not need spiritual gifts in heaven because we'll have Christ. And as a result, we will be fully as an adult and we will be able to see us as Christ sees us face to face. He finishes off with, Now I know in part, and then I will shall know fully, even as I am fully known. I only know part of the story right now. Then when I'm with Christ, I will see it all. I will see why he's done the good, the bad, and the indifferent. And then he concludes with this most wonderful phrase, uh, sentence. And now these things remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. When we use our spiritual gifts, we strengthen people's faith. We instill the hope that Christ is returning in them. But the greatest gift we give to them of all is the gift of love. So what's love got to do with it? Everything. Thanks for joining us.